Susan Siegel. Welcome to the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour. Great. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for asking me. Of course. So for listeners that are perhaps not familiar with Susan, she is the CEO and co-founder of Mobility International USA. She is also a wheelchair writer, author, lecturer, and a passionate disability rights activist. She has edited and authored several publications to advance the rights of people with disabilities around the world. She has received numerous awards and distinctions in recognition of her work, including the prestigious MacArthur Fellowship and Ashoka Fellowship, a Rotary Scholarship Alumni Award, the President's Award from the Honorable Bill Clinton, and an honorary doctorate from Chapman University. She lives in Eugene, Oregon with her partner Tom and her dog Yum Yum. Can I just say that I love that dog name? Yes. yes. <laughs> How he's, a, he's a gigantic dog. He's 152 pounds. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so wow. I'm going to dive in with what your disability is. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and your disability? So I know that you were in a car crash when you were 18 years old. Mm-hmm. Well, basically, you know, I usually don't talk so much about my my disability, but, um, you know, I had the interesting thing when I was uh, growing up as a non-disabled person, I was actually interested in working with people with disabilities. I was very very sports oriented and skated and skied and danced and then um, then when I became disabled I'm a, a paraplegic um, um, and I'm a uh, use a wheelchair now all the time and I really had that experience of you know one minute being a non-disabled person the next minute being a person with disability and I just really wanted to continue working with the idea of working with disabled people so I think for me the most important thing is that I think that my rights bearing attitude has a lot to do with the fact that I always expected to have the same rights as non-disabled people as I was a non-disabled person so it just seemed just um, I just couldn't understand why once you're a wheelchair rider why would you then you know not be able to I was living in New York not be able to get on the subway at that time you know have such a difficulty uh, getting jobs employment so for me I'm, I feel it just um, my accident just really enabled me to be even a more passionate um, disability rights activist and as you know I've continued to do sports and recreation and I have over a million miles on an airline I, I travel a lot independently so I'm really um, I'm really just um, just to me it's really at this point in my life it's not a, at all a negative part of who I am just uh, another part of uh, who I am and and, um, and and trying to really empower other disabled people around the world so they have this the same rights as non-disabled people as well. I really appreciate your joyous hearts. I feel like you really spread that passion and that enthusiasm and optimism around. So in terms of you're saying you use the uh, wheelchair most of the time, um, what what kind of wheelchair do you use? Well, I um, I use um, as I say, and I I'm a what sometimes called, um, as I use a wheelchair now all the time, I am a bit of an incomplete paraplegic. So I, I am able, if um, necessary, to take one or two uh, steps. But um, I am fortunate that I'm using just a lightweight wheelchair. It's actually a, a, a titanium wheelchair. And when I travel, I've actually found great luggage where I, since I travel by myself, I just put a you know, a, a backpack on the back of my wheelchair and a backpack underneath my wheelchair where there's a basket. And it doesn't matter whether it's three days or three months, that's all I take so I can uh, maneuver easily and my both my wheels uh, pop a uh, quick release pop off. So if I need to get into a regular car or th- a taxi, I can I can do that. You were saying that you have you've traveled, you know, you have a, a, over a million miles. I, I'm assuming you experience a variation of uh, wheelchair malfunctions over the years how have you dealt with them right well actually you know I you know probably knock on whatever you're supposed to knock on I have been pretty fortunate I've had you know 
definitely um, I carry an extra tube and stuff if I get a flat tire, but the first thing I do if I get a flat or something, I, you know, if I'm in a city, at least go to um, a bike store. So I tend, so usually bike stores can replace flats and things like that. Um, I've had two wheelchairs, you know, destroyed by the airlines and then uh, just luckily, they both happened on my way home, and so um, I do have an extra wheelchair at home. So while my other chair was being repaired, or um, I was able to do that, so I've been uh, relatively lucky in in terms of that. But I know that many people have had many nightmare stories on uh, bad things happening. But I am um, hoping that that never is a deterrent. And as you know, you know, we at Mobility International, we're really interested in people with disabilities when they think about travel is thinking about what we call travel with a purpose. So to think about going on an international exchange program or volunteering abroad. And as you know, our organization gives lots of free information for people with all types of disabilities who might think about studying abroad or volunteering abroad or being a Fulbright Scholar or Peace Corps or a high school exchange student. So I'm hoping that many people who are listening to this will get excited about that idea and look at our website and and uh, think about what they can do with their lives to travel more and to maybe live in another country for a short while. I, um, having interned for you, I know you offer First, amazing uh, opportunities for people of, of various dif- disabilities. So you talked a little bit about the accessories that are on your wheelchair. You know, you strap a pick a backpack to the back of your wheelchair, and then underneath there's a ba- there's a basket that you can put things in. What other wheelchair accessories would you like to see made available? What, what I use is the other thing that I do is I when I have as you said a backpack on the back of my wheelchair. I also have a, a small backpack that I put under in the basket. I also also have a I think they're like mountain climbing carabiners and I always put my smaller backpack that tends to have let's say passport or my money and I use carabiners to secure the backpack underneath it because otherwise it'd be real easy for that to fall out and that's why you, for security you never have to worry about it I also sometimes use what's new I believe it's called a free wheel and you can get it on freewheel.com like if I was in um, I just was in Barcelona and definitely in Prague in the places where there there's like either a lot of cobblestones or a lot of un- uneven places or you know, on grass. It's an attachment um, that you can buy and it lifts up your front two wheels and then there's sort of a big wheel that hooks onto your wheelchair in front. Um, and I think on our website there's some pictures of that. And I don't use that all the time, but it, amazingly it fits. You can carry it on the back of your wheelchair. It's actually designed by a quadriplegic. And I think for those types of places that helps. And then on a lesser scale, I also have a, just a very simple cup holder that attaches to my wheelchair because you never know when you, it helps for like having either holding a hot chocolate or for my work, I go to a lot of receptions. It's the perfect thing to carry your wine glass in. <laughs> Did you design that um, yourself or? No, I think it's, you know, I think actually the basket under my chair was given to me by a wonderful disability rights activist from Mexico and I think this cup holder thing you could probably probably just got online or at one of those um, you know stores that sell disability products so that's pretty simple you could probably also just get a cup and tape it on yourself so I'm really into low cost you know, easy, easy things, I think, are always the way to go because I say these things, when you travel, I can get destroyed very easily, so you don't want something too fancy. So with the free wheel, when you're not using um, it, do you just put it in the back of your chair then? Because it, yeah, it, yeah, it fits. Actually, it's quite amazing. It'll fit like I don't have any push handles on my wheelchair, but it fits on the back of like this little whatever titanium bar. And it, it's amazing. It sort of folds up and fits on that. And even with that, I can throw my backpack over the wheel. So when I'm traveling, I can, I can do that. Also, and I say I only travel with that on at certain places that have cobblestone or other things. I don't travel with it 
all the time. And um, I also, you know, never check my chair all the way through. I always, you know, like I think most people make sure that that I have my wheelchair every time I switch airports, that it's always um, waiting for me. And I, I, so I try to, you know, really as much as possible, um, do everything I can to, you know, have my wheelchair in sight and have it available at all times because it's, it's my key to independence. I read an article where you mentioned that, you know, one of your most challenging experiences when you were a student um, at U of O was dealing with the inaccessibility on campus. So you filed some ADA related architectural complaints, which you said were immediately resolved. Could you walk through the process to filing these complaints for younger wheelchair users who are not as informed about the process and perhaps are even in- intimidated by it? Yeah, sure. And one of the things, and as I say, you know, that that was many years ago, but I, I think it's important, you know, for those of us who are disability rights activists and wheelchair riders, that when you come upon whether it's an inaccessible restaurant or a workplace, you know, the first thing I would do is, you know, talk to the people there and try to resolve it. Um, you know, talk to the staff, go as high up as you can and try to, you know, just see if it's possible to resolve it. If you've tried, you know, calling, writing, emailing, doing all those things and you feel like you've been working on it, you know, for a while and nothing is moving, then actually if you just go on the website, there's um, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, they think they, they have a whole form. You can file a complaint, I think, federal or through the state. But, you know, things change, so you should just Google it and see what usually there's um, – sometimes there's things called the Protection and Advocacy offices in each state. There's a fabulous organization called DREDF, the Disability Rights Education Defense Fund in Berkeley that has a lot of information. But if you're not getting what you need to be done, and it's a very simple form usually just to fill out and to file a complaint, because the ADA is complaint-based. So if people with disabilities don't file those complaints, then the law won't be as effective as it can be, because most businesses let's say follow the law but if somebody doesn't you need to complain not only for yourself but then you're also paving the way so other disabled people can uh, can you know can use the service or get into the building so I think it's, it's important that all of us um, just try to resolve it first through human contact and Hopefully people will resolve that, but when that doesn't work, then you need to go, I think, to take action legally. That's a great point, yeah. So let's get down to the heart um, of Mobility know. International USA. So what inspired you to to co-found Mayusa? Tell us a little bit about your early days, who your other uh, founder was. Yeah, sure. So I was a undergraduate, actually, at the University of California at Berkeley, and I saw an ad in the newspaper saying, be an ambassador of goodwill, all expenses paid. And I thought, oh my gosh, that sounds so fabulous. And I applied, and it was for a Rotary scholarship, and I get to pick if I got accepted where I want. And I was probably one of the first wheelchair users to to apply for that type of program and I got accepted and I spent a year at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia and I had the most amazing year. I did all sorts of wild things and and had a just just a unbelievable fabulous time like many non-disabled people who have a, take a year abroad but I it really struck me that there were no other people with disabilities who were participating in international exchange like non-disabled people do so after I finished my year in Australia I traveled through Malaysia Indonesia Thailand with another friend of mine um, I did some wild things like hitchhiking my wheelchair through New Zealand with a friend who actually also was in a wheelchair and then I came back and I decided to finish my master's degree at the University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon and Barbara Williams I met her and she was also a graduate student and we just decided to co-found this organization called Mobility International with the idea of increasing the number of people with disabilities all types of disabilities and all types of international exchange And from that, which was now, I think, like, oh, my gosh, maybe 37 years ago, we have not only 
had many disabled people join existing international exchange programs, study abroad, but we've also uh, run our own leadership programs. We're known for our disabled women's leadership programs. We're doing lots of different types of work that you could see on our website. But it really, you know, it really started just at while I was a student. So I guess my message is, you know, I really want to encourage maybe people who are listening to have ideas, perhaps their students or whoever, to, you know, to surround yourself by people who maybe think that your idea is a good idea and um, when possible to either get a job in either international exchange, we also work in international development, or sometime for many disabled people, it's starting their own organizations. You established MyUSA um, in 1981, um, you know, trying to transform disability inclusion within international development. And uh, you want to change the perspective and practice of development organizations from a medical uh, charity-based framework to a rights-based framework. Um, what has changed since then, and what specific advice do you have for, uh, say, younger generations who want to progress dis- disability inclusion um, even further, just picking up from from your generation? Yeah, that's a yeah great question. Well, one of the things I think that has changed. I just came from Washington D.C. where. We're a member of an umbrella organization called Interaction, and the website is interaction.org. And I was at the CEO retreat and met with many CEOs um, who run all sorts of humanitarian and international development organizations. And they are now really excited about um, hiring and including more people with disabilities. I think it's part of the whole move now toward diversity, whether it's youth, LGBT folks, um, just, you know, gender issues. I just think that there's a new, I think, a new brand of CEOs who, instead of we're fighting with them about including disabled people, they're saying, yes, we want to do it. How can we do it? So if you go on our website, you can see lots of initiatives that we're doing. So I think one of the best ways to get in the door is um, is you need to have experience. So one, I would suggest trying to have some type of international exchange experience where you learn another language or study a volunteer in a country. You can look at our website under the National Clearinghouse on Disability and Exchange, which is part of MIUSA, and get some free information and there's lots of stories and podcasts podcasts and things you can look. And then I also, where possible, look for any of these programs they you know, and and think about as you did, you know, becoming an intern because even at my use in a lot of places, once you're an intern, if you learn a lot, if you do good work, that's usually a great way then of perhaps getting hired and getting a taste of deciding if this is the field for you. And if it is, it's a great beginning of then hopefully then moving up in those organizations and um, being being leaders. I'm really looking for people with disabilities to be leaders in international development programs, international exchange programs, not just participants. So I certainly see you as a leader in, in the disability rights field. So during your three plus decades of um, working at MIUSA and leading the organization, what are you most proud of when you think of all the things you've been able to achieve with with MIUSA? Well, thanks. Well, first of all, I have to say that um, all the achievements that MIUSA has made, as um, um, hopefully I've led the organization well, but I've only been able to lead it well because I have great staff. And over the many years, the staff have really the ones that make the programs happen, interns like you who are an intern and, and other people. So I really want to give credit to that. Um, I, you know, I don't, again, I don't know if there's one thing I'm, I'm really excited about um, that the fact that we have 2,300 alumni from 135 countries, I think, to be able to affect so many people and have them go and affect other people in their country. I'm really proud of our women's program, our WILD program, and so many of the WILD women we've stayed in touch with, and they're doing amazing things. We just did a regional WILD program in in Sri Lanka, and I'm really exciting now the work that we're doing to change organizations like international development organizations and women's rights organizations to help them be uh, more inclusive. Um, I think it's going to take 
lots of different um, sectors and lots of different people um, to affect change. And it's going to take laws and policies and civil society and community um, people who are just working on the grassroots community. I think it's going to take lots of different things happening all at once um, to make the changes that need to happen. So I see that you, at least at one point, was teaching a course at the University of Oregon on global perspectives on disability, and as well as serving as a, as a member of the President's Diversity Advisory Community Council. How has teaching provided a new avenue for you to advocate for disability? rights. Right. Well, thank you, Anne. We're very excited. We're teaching the class again this year, and it's both an undergraduate and a graduate course. And uh, some people have mentioned maybe we should also take that course online so that more people could take it. And I think that would be a great idea. And I teach it, co-teach it with Suze Dunn, who's one of our fabulous staff who, who work with me. And I think what it what has been so exciting about that is that it really lets me hear from you know younger people who are at university who might be you know international studies majors or psychology majors or all all different types of majors there's usually some people with disabilities a lot without disabilities and for a lot of them they say this is the first time that they took a class at the university that it really talked about disability rights. And, you know, they've had classes maybe that it was more a medical model of disability, but that this class not only was a disability rights class, but really no matter what career they're going into, gave them an idea how they could be part of the disability rights movement. And I think that's been really great. And I have to say that usually the people in the class are just so innovative and and so positive that I'm looking forward to when maybe then when they are the leaders in the world that a lot of the discrimination that exists won't exist anymore because they seem so much more open open minded and so much more coming from a human rights framework. Wow, that's great to hear um, for what's coming up next. So next, we're going to move on to women with disabilities. Um, intrinsic to your work is a focus on the issue of women with disabilities. So why have you focused a major part of your work specifically on on women with disabilities? Well, obviously, um, one is that you know growing up as a woman with a disability, um, it's obviously near and dear to my heart and just the inequality between disabled men and disabled women in terms of having less chance of education, more chance of having violence, less chance of having health care. Um, there's, there's so many things where disabled women, you know, globally are doubly discriminated against. But as we always like to say, yes, that's all true. But I also think for being a disabled woman also gives women two things to be proud of. One is to be a woman and to feel proud of who they are and also to be a woman with disability, which I see as being part of this amazing family of disabled women and to turn that into a positive aspect of your identity. And so, um, you know, our, actually our work has been both with disabled men and women, but uh, we're very much known for our disabled women's program. And one of our trademark slogans is loud, proud, and passionate. And that's, so, you know, some of the things that we're trying to, to, to give to disabled women so they can go back and make the changes for other disabled women in their countries and the communities because our our wild program is definitely a train the trainer model right now it is for people from outside the u.s mostly the uh, global south but um i think disabled women is just um a powerful force i also realize now that many people maybe who are listening don't necessarily identify as either male or female and so i think we also really need to look at gender issues realizing that many people are gender fluid or non-conforming as well yeah it sounds like a great program mm-hmm. um, you've advocated for international exchange obviously for a long time and, and believe that it's important and even more so important for people with disabilities students with disabilities why is study abroad more important for students with disabilities rather than able-bodied students in comparison. So, you know, I think, you know, obviously it's important to both the 
disabled and non-disabled, but I think perhaps there's even more impact, maybe that's a better way of saying it for people with disabilities, because it breaks down so many preconceived notions of what's possible. I mean, so many people with disabilities may not think you know, they could go study in Spain or in, you know, in Vietnam or, um, you know, anywhere really in Japan and and just just not believing that that stereotype is wrong, that people with disabilities are Fulbright scholars, are Peace Corps volunteers, are high school exchange participants. I think it boosts, it's like a trampoline, I guess. It just, then when you go later and you, whether you're applying to university or for a job and you have that on, the, on your resume, not only do you have those intercultural and global skills, but again, it, it, just, um, it just accelerates your resume. And I think really, whether you're disabled or not, to be a leader in the world today, you have to have some uh, global experiences. And I think also then the non-disabled people see you um, as part of their colleagues in the program and then also I think that the changes that you might make for disabled people in other countries who you might meet and share ideas and learn from disabled people there um, I just think it's a, just another way of making social change and disability rights change and plus it's just super fun and uh, really exciting I, I think yeah, I'm sure, I think you probably have done lots of travel yourself. It's just, it's so exhilarating and so important work. I mean, there's definitely ups and downs, but I'm, I'm hoping that some people will hear this and it will plant a seed for something that they might like to do with their lives as well. Traveling certainly opens your eyes to new perspectives and and uh, new windows to different worlds. So I I really like your Women's Institute on Leadership and Disability program, WILD program, as you were talking about uh, earlier. Do these individuals with disabilities who are coming from the global south mainly, do they need to be fluent in English in order to participate in the program? Um, actually, no. And actually, we um, we just had a call for applications when, for July of 2019, which is now closed. But just to give you an example, for like the, we have about 25 openings for participants, and we had like I think over 370 applications. Just to give you an idea how many people applied. So we have, our program is for three weeks and it's in both in Spanish and English. It's also translated into American Sign Language. And because obviously many people who are deaf don't know American Sign Language, we also use CDIs, which are Certified Deaf Interpreters, which sort of takes the um, ASL language and makes it, there's no international sign language, but makes it a bit more accessible to people who are deaf from other countries. So definitely we have lots of interpreting. We have probably a team of 10, 14 Spanish, English, ASL, CDI interpreters happening. Um, in some other programs, we've also translated some of them into Arabic, into Russian. It just depends on our funding. But the truth is that many people with disabilities and we're looking for grassroots leaders haven't had the chance to learn English so we really think it's important to have the program in other languages as well. So you're looking to expand into other languages? Yeah well for this year we'll probably do Spanish it's really a funding issues but we also just did our first regional wild program and that was in Sri Lanka and we had people coming from Nepal and Sri Lanka and uh, China and um, we also, in that program, I believe, translated into Chinese. So it just d depends um, on on the funding. But I think, you know, that women, wherever they are with disabilities, I think it's, you know, sometimes we say it's important to go to some programs that are run for and by disabled women, but there's lots of just women's leadership programs around the world that are happening and in the United States. I think it's also important that disabled women join those programs as well and and build build the disability rights movement by joining other movements like the women's movement and other women's leadership programs. I want to follow up with, so you have you know, English, Spanish, different um, variations of sign language. Um, depending on funding, you are looking to expand into uh, other languages, hence accepting more people from different countries. Is that what I'm yeah. hearing? 
Yeah. Well, in the past, like in other some of the programs in the past, we did translate into Arabic, and other programs, I think once. Um, we've done um, some French translation for women coming um, from certain parts of Africa, but it's really just, it, I mean, it, translation costs a lot of funds, so it just, each year we just have to decide how much funding we have and which languages we can translate it to. So for 2019 WILD, which we already say that is already, the application um, process is closed, but in, the, in that particular program, we'll be translated into Spanish, English, American Sign Language, and use, using uh, certified deaf interpreters. So moving on to both of our favorite subjects, travel. So what's been the most daring thing you've done abroad? You know, the thing that I, as you probably know, I, I wrote a memoir, which people can get on Amazon.com. It's called No Ordinary Days, a, a journey of activism, globe trotting, and unexpected pleasures. And in that book, I think the thing that surprises most people is when I was studying in Australia, I hitchhiked throughout New Zealand for six weeks in my wheelchair with a colleague of mine who also happened to be in a wheelchair. So that was two of us in wheelchairs hitchhiking for six weeks. I do say I would not recommend doing that today. I think, unfortunately, things are a lot more dangerous and not the world that it was then. So I wouldn't recommend hitchhiking then, I mean now. But at that time, it was safe. And it actually, I'm still in contact with many of the people who gave us rides. And we actually got invited to stay in people's homes every night for six weeks. And I'm literally, I just sent an email to someone the other night who I'm still in touch with us who just picked us up hitchhiking. Uh, that is, and then now then, um, as I'm a bit older, one of my passions is is I have an adaptive bicycle, so um, I have a bike that has an electrical assist in the front hub, and I put my wheelchair on the back. And my idea when I go on a vacation is uh, took my adaptive bicycle, and with uh, my partner, we bicycled through the Outer Hebrides of Scotland about two, three times, and also bicycled through parts of Europe. Um, so bicycling is definitely a way that I love to, to travel because you meet so many people and it's, it's just uh, just one of my passions. And it's a good way to get some exercise while you're at it. Exactly. So whether you use, some people I know use hand cycles, some people who have a little bit of motion in their legs might use the electrical assist, um, you know, and also people who... You know, many people, I would say, also travel independently by traveling with a personal assistant. I mean, I think traveling independently means making your own choices about what you want to do and when you want to do it. So if you're a person with a disability who for you to travel means traveling with a friend or a personal assistant, I consider that traveling independently because as long as you're calling all the shots, um, I think that's also another way that people with all types of disabilities should be able to travel. So I know you've traveled to some pretty accessible cities in the last few months, D.C., Barcelona. What's been the most wheelchair accessible city you've been to around the world? You know, I never know. I'm, I'm really terrible on what is the most. I have to say that in, for instance, Barcelona, the 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 buses, at least the ones I was taking, I found to be pretty accessible. Um, a lot of times in the Scandinavian countries, the public transportation seems to be accessible. Um, but there's also, they have a lot of frustrating things too, where you expect it to be accessible and it's not, and then you're really surprised. So, um, yeah, I always sort of shy a little bit away from, I don't know if there's a place that has the most accessible. Um, I think the same with, you know, using airlines. I think if you fly in a United States carrier, you're protected by the uh, Air Carriers Access, um, Carriers Act, which means you have more rights about your wheelchair and if something happens to it. So I do try to tend when I can to 
to stay on U.S. carriers because of the legal protection. So for me, I I feel like D.C. is definitely one of the most wheelchair accessible cities I've ever lived in. With you know right. all the buses being wheelchair accessible yeah. and all the metro stations having an, an elevator. Right. I guess in the, in the U.S. definitely Washington D.C., uh, San Francisco, the BART is accessible across all places. Sometimes the elevator breaks down. You have to deal with that. All the buses are accessible. And actually, uh, here in good old Eugene, Oregon, where our office is based, I do think it is one of the most accessible places. All our buses were accessible before the Americans with Disabilities Act. We have, you can rent an adaptive bicycle, you can go skiing, you can go river rafting, um, you can do lots of things. So I, I find, you, you know, people don't know much about Eugene, Oregon, but it's definitely up there in, in, in very accessible cities. And then I think, too, um, I have a colleague in Mexico who is really teaching disabled people, a lot of wheelchair riders. He runs a program um, really teaching disabled people how in Mexico they can, you know, take control of their own lives and do what they do. So I think the the power of disabled people trying to do be the you know, do the best that they can and make changes in the country is happening all over the world and we, we have a website called Global Disability Rights Now. Dot org, which talks about disabled people ch making changes legally in places like Armenia, Mexico, Peru, Guatemala, uh, uh, Kenya, Armenia. So again, we're, I think the ADA has really helped us here in the United States, but there's also many disabled people around the world who are also fighting equally hard to get stronger laws in their country. What were some of the biggest challenges traveling as a wheelchair user over the years? Um, and what are some solution plans that you have in mind that, you know, should you be able to propose to the relevant people that, that you want to voice? Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely, and you definitely, I think, you know, getting into bathrooms is always an issue. Um, there's definitely a long way to go in most places outside the U.S. in terms of getting accessible bathrooms. I think having people be surprised that you're traveling by yourself or again having lower expectations of you is something that you know you just have to tell people you know sort of correct some of their misconceptions of what people with disabilities can do in some countries that i've traveled you know you know, a lot of times if you're a person with a disability, there's a lot of staring. I, you know, I'm from New York. I, t I can stare back equally well. So I think you just have to be very confident in who you are. I really encourage people who, who like me, who I try to meet other disabled people. Like when I studied a year in Australia, I played wheelchair basketball. I signed up with actually was a men's team and I got to be one of the only women on their team. Um, but meeting other disabled people also is also really fun as, as something to do. But um, I, I think you have to be, you have to just realize that for all the, the things that you deal with, that you need to say something and try to make it better. Um, because you're also paving the way for other disabled people to come and, you know, to also have that experience. And I think the world is only going to change as we, as people with disabilities, really tell people, file complaints when you need to file complaints and really, um, you know, not, you know, if some places a great restaurant and if it's not accessible but that's the restaurant I want to eat at I'm gonna go in there and then really complain about why isn't it accessible but I'm if that's where I want to eat then that's where I'm going exactly so change is not gonna happen on its own um, we all have to speak up and you know file those complaints and voice our opinions moving on to the fun part perhaps what are the perks and advantages of traveling in a wheelchair well, I was just thinking about that when I, when I just filled with several trips one of the things is that you know with all the negative things happen lots of people are super helpful you know, cut bathroom lines, you know, get, sometimes I just got discounted tickets to see theater things that you would probably never get to ha have happen. Um, you know, that's why I think I named the, the memoir that I wrote, No Ordinary Days, because 
or you know it's never ordinary so i think i think sometimes you know things happen to you that don't necessarily happen to non-disabled people the good and the bad but I find people are, I almost feel like people are looking out for me, making things easier. So with all the negative things that happen, usually a lot more positive things happen um, as well. But both are true, bad things and good things happen. Um, so, and then of course there's, you know, I the parking permit, having a disabled parking permit is helpful, but obviously I'm sure many listeners agree when you see people in in disabled parking places who probably, um, you know, don't, should not be in them, that gets very frustrating too. But, you know, I'm definitely a person who thinks that the joy and the excitement of travel far outweighs the negative, and, but you do have to, you know, be mentally ready that there is discrimination out the world and it's not going to be simple and, um, you know, just uh, to be able to, to, to do it joyfully, but also when things aren't right, being able to call it out and know that you're, you're doing it for the family of people with disabilities globally who are all in the same yeah, fight. keeping the bigger picture in mind. I like that. I, I always feel inspired when I hear of people with disabilities founding or starting something new, creating this new path. So my question for you is, what advice do you have for people with disabilities who are trying to, say, start their own business like you did with a nonprofit? What resources would you have liked to have seen made of av- made available when you were starting your own nonprofit? Oh, thank you. That's a great question. So one of the things is I would say, first of all, you need to surround yourself by positive people because that's what I had when I uh, started um, Mobile International. Like people like, yeah, we can do it. How are we going to do it? I think that's really important. I think it's really important to start small. I think sometimes people it doesn't work because you're trying to do too much or raise too much money. Like if you start small and you're successful and then you can build, I think that's another important lesson. Also now I think the buzzword is definitely social entrepreneurship with how people can do things that will just by their innovations become self-supporting, but they're self-supporting for the greater good of of humanity. So I definitely recommend people look at another website um, called Ashoka, and I'm going to spell that, A-S-H-O-K-A dot org. And there, there is lots of examples of people, both, it's not a, a specifically disability thing, it's for anybody. But there's lots of ideas of young people around the world who have started their own um, businesses for the greater good. And actually, you can uh, you can self-nominate to be an Ashoka Fellow, and you have to have some really innovative idea. And if you go through their process and if you're selected, they will actually help do some funding for you. So those are, I guess, some of the um, the tips that I I would have uh, for for people who have an idea to either start something on your own or join an organization. I really suggest people, if you look interested in international, look at interaction.org and see over 170 organizations and, and think about maybe trying to get an internship or a job with an organization that you think has shares your values or is doing uh, good work. So. That's, that would be my suggestion. And it's, again, not simple. You've got to be persistent. you got to be resilient. But um, you got to try. So that would be my, my suggestion. Yeah, those are great resources to point to. Uh, what challenges do leaders in wheelchairs face in terms of starting a new organization or company that are different from the general population? Yeah. You know, I don't really think there's anything um, particular that would be different uh, from it. Again, I think the only thing you might have against you is somebody's preconceived notion about what people with disabilities can do. But I think hopefully those ideas are getting a bit outdated in many places now i think the world is changing and yes there's always going to be discrimination out there but i i would say that uh you know being a wheelchair rider you should just forge on as 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 anybody else does um and i think there have been i'm i'm sure they've been on your program uh, many 
uh, disabled people who have who have um, started organizations like the Disability Rights Education Defense Fund um, was started by some people with disabilities um, and many others. So yeah, I, I don't I don't think there's necessarily a, a bigger challenge, and if people don't think that you can do it, who cares? You know you, you can do it, so you just need to, as they say, be persistent. Yeah, good point. So looking into the future, I see that you've done some well, work with the State Department and USAID uh, to ensure that individuals with disabilities are included in all aspects of international development. So you've clearly been involved on in international front uh, with disabled people's organizations and governments around the world to advance the rights of people with disabilities. What is the key to collaborating and working with such a wide and diverse group of people. Right. Well, I think, you know, we started many years with the State Department. Um, again, I think we were doing something that at that time was unique, a bit, which was including people with disabilities and all types of exchange and running our own exchange programs. I think now that is sort of standard and there's many organizations who are doing that, which is good. Um, I think uh, again, I just got off a conference call and they're talking that they're having, you know, I think there should be stronger regulations in like with USAID that any project that's funded, you know, it must include people with disabilities. There is some language in USAID that if they build any structures overseas that they have to be accessible. So I think there's, you know, some good things in that, but I think one of the things I'd say if you want to work with lots of different people, whether it's USAID, State Department, is building relationships. And that was some advice I got many years ago that many, you have to be, as they start small, you have to be, you know, good at what you do. You have to have good evaluation, deliver good programs. But you also need to meet lots of people and form good relationships with people because, you um, that's usually what makes the difference with successful organizations is who do you have relationships with, um, how much do people trust you, how much is your word good, how, what is the quality of the programs that you do. So those are some of the things that I would focus on when, when trying to deal with lots of different, both small, small projects and and working with big government entities and networking, um, interaction puts on a conference in Washington, D.C. every year. So they say you can uh, volunteer for that conference and not have to pay uh, so much of the registration fee. That might be a great way to meet lots of people and begin some of those relationship building. Yeah, that's a very good resources to point to as well. Living in D.C., there really are so many places that you can um, look into and connect with. Are you optimistic about the future of... Uh, you know, both domestically and internationally, about the progress of the disability rights movement? If yes, I, why? I tend to be an optimist, so probably no matter what, I'm going to say, yes, I want to be optimistic. I think definitely we're in some challenging um, times, that's for sure. But I, when I meet the leaders, um, whether they're the older established leaders, the younger leaders at some of the conferences that some of the folks from the independent living movement join, when I see the young disabled leaders from all over the world, I think they're passionate. I think there's, I think p people will not accept discrimination anymore. I think disability is finally becoming part of diversity. I'm seeing other movements like the LGBT movement, the indigenous movement, um, build strength. So I think one of the things is I'd like to see the disability movement closely aligned with some of the other movements too, because I think all movements need to, wherever possible, with human rights lawyers, the environmental activists. Um, I'd like to see that the word green means accessible. I think that's something that we need to make happen as well. So um, there's no point not being optimistic. I think that will not give you the energy that you need to make change. Um, so I would say um, no matter what the good times are, the bad times, as someone once said, despair is not a strategy. <laughs> um, I think you've got to really just, uh, you know, they, they always say, like, 
keep your eyes on the prize. I mean, imagine the world that you want to see, and our job is to do what we can while we're alive to work toward that vision. Make the best of it. In your lifetime, you know, as being someone who's has been using a wheelchair since she was 18 years old, um, how, what progress have you seen over the course of your life? And uh, I know that sounds like a, a, you know, a a mouthful and overwhelming to answer perhaps, but, um, and uh, ideally how much, where do you want, speaking of, you know, the, the, the vision, where do you want to see us ideally? As a well, no, I think that's a great question. I mean, for me, I think, and I do actually do think about this literally every day. I mean, I know the United States is not perfect. I'm sure there's many listeners that are listening to this, and there's a million things that are still not okay, and I really want to acknowledge that. But I do think that passing the Americans with Disabilities Act you know, drastically change the everyday life of people with disabilities. That, you know, every new bus had to be accessible. Every building has to, you know, be accessible. You can't be discriminated against in terms of employment. There's relay services for people who are deaf. Um, I just think, the you know, whether you go to buy a pair of jeans, the dressing room, the fitting room has to be accessible. I just think that for me when I think what the world was like before that and since that is drastically different um, I think you know in terms of education too having disabled people be in the regular school systems um, is you know to the you know is really has changed things so I think for me the ADA was definitely a drastic difference between the before and after and um, I still think there's a lot of still work to do in the United States and a lot of work to do globally but I as we write a lot about on our website you know there are certain principles about that um, that basically that disabled people have to have the exact same opportunities as non-disabled people and and how that gets achieved is, is something that doesn't belong to one country, but really belongs to everybody in the world. Um, I'd like to see change happen faster. I speak a lot about moving from inclusion to infiltration, that especially in, outside the U.S. and inside the U.S., if, some, if you see a program or a service or anything that you want to be part of, you should just assume that you can and go go for it, not wait for someone to invite you or wait for them to have a disability workshop. And um, I'm hoping that more disabled people will just be more assertive, whether it means you know, going to the local swimming pool, going to the university, you know, joining a, a, any program, any anything that they want to do that that you just realize that that's those are your programs this is your society and you have a right to be part of it as much as anybody else and not wait for an invitation but just to to do it that is a perfect uh, wrap so, that was our last question but did you have anything to add in closing in terms of life motto any last of words of wisdom okay well first of all just a real big thank you to you and all the work that you do and i've seen you here in washington dc working for congress people all over so just thank you for being who you are and all the work that you've done and um, yeah I really I hope that in some way that um, people will hear some of the information here whether it's about inter- getting involved in the international development field going on an international exchange program um, being more proactive on getting their rights um, I just really want to just thank everyone who is listening of listening and um, just really, I, I know there's still a lot of problems, a lot of discrimination in the world, and I just wish everyone lots of resilience and persistence and, and also optimism on having the life that you want to live. So with that, I will um, end it, and thank you so much. Of course, and thank you.